Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video is going to be going on an introduction about Ferruginous Hawks, which is a subject uh, that doesn't get talked about enough, and even though there's a lot of interest, so I hope this is a valuable video today. Uh, before I jump in, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. It really helps me keep this channel going. And please uh, let, leave comments and questions and thoughts down in the comments below. It's also very helpful for this channel. Um, so Ferruginous Hawks. Uh, are an amazing species and one that uh, there's a lot of misinformation on and one that a lot of people have not really flown. I've had a chance to fly several of them over the years and I uh, have a lot of friends who have too. But uh, a fruginous hawk, what is it? So in, I live in the United States and in the United States we say normally we're like that is our largest hawk. The fruginous hawk is our largest species of hawk. Um, but then of course this, since this is a uh, worldwide opportunity for people to watch falconer videos i have to say in the united states we wrongly use the term hawk for a lot of uh genus that are not hawks okay so technically uh the true hawks are the occipiters so that's birds like the northern goshawk these are forest dwellers that have long tails short rounded wings they're meant for diving in and out of brush and trees okay flash and dash those are the true hawks uh but there's a whole genus of, of raptors called budios and most of the rest of the world outside of the United States calls them buzzards. Now, uh, the, these are not true hawks. They are soaring birds, birds of the open country. This whole genus, long, broad wings, long tails, built for, for soaring and gliding, uh, comparatively slower metabolism than the true hawks. And the ferruginous hawk is the largest of these budios, or buzzards, that we have in the United States. And they're giant. Now, uh, saying that, if you're just getting into falconry, it's really easy to just think it's like a, a bigger, beefed-up red-tailed hawk. So when you're looking at Budios, uh, a red-tailed hawk is, in my mind, kind of like the baseline for for these for Budios. Okay, it's it just it's proportioned. It's built like a tank, very large, powerful feet, long tail, long, rounded, broad wings, uh, and so red-tailed hawk is kind of just your, your standard, your standard budio. Well, um, if you are just getting into falconry or bird watching or wildlife education, you're learning about these animals and you open up a field guide. The problem is a lot of these artists are amazing artists, but their emphasis in a field, they've never held a ferruginous hawk. They've never looked at one up close. So they get the field markings right. But in a lot of these field guides, these illustrated field guides, it's all about the markings, the coloration patterns, and the proportions are off. It just looks like a beefy a red tail or just like a red tail with, with that coloration on. So if you know that, then you got to understand that in person, in real life, a fruginous hawk is very different. Uh, that there's a lot of nuances and subtlety to their build that is off, kind of extreme. Uh, I think the first one would be the head. Fruginous hawks have an enormous oversized head and overly wide beak, a big gape to their mouth. Uh, sometimes uh, people affectionately nickname them frogs because they have this enormous mouth. And they use that, you know, of course they'll tear apart their food. Usually a beak is just the eating utensil of a raptor. Uh, a lot of people if you're not a falconer, you're not used to working with raptors, it's easy to wrongly think, oh, the beak is how they attack. And that's usually not the case with raptors. Feet are the business end, the beak is the eating utensil. But there are some exceptions with that. I've talked to a couple of biologists and uh, a quite uh, well-renowned uh, wildlife photographer who's done a lot of little documentaries on it, uh, who have in the field just observed these birds and extensively and said a lot of times for uh, rough uh, fruginous hawks, will kill with their beak and they'll and they'll even try to swallow their prey whole so oversized beak but the feet are tiny now that's relatively speaking and again if you consider a red-tailed hawk kind of your baseline um uh, Budio, then a fruginous hawk, by comparison, proportionally, has much smaller feet. They are powerful, but they're short and they are stumpy. Now, don't let the size of the toes fool you as far as the strength. You have to think about your hand, for example, okay? Uh, and it's not a raptor's foot, but it's the same principles, right? You have tendons that run down to muscles here. And when, the, when these muscles pull, they grip your hand. You could have bony, skinny fingers, and it doesn't mean they're not strong. It's how big is the muscle here that's pulling the tendons 
to grip the hand or the foot in the case of ferruginous hawks. So ferruginous hawks, the tendons and the musculature in the legs is over the top powerful. It's just attached and pulling really stumpy toes. Doesn't matter. When you're hunting, that's just fine. They are normally going after, like, functionally, functionally, a ferruginous hawk functions as a prairie eagle. Now, where they live, they will overlap with golden eagles, but they'll also inhabit some areas that golden eagles are just like turn their nose up to. And, and then they fill that role. They're like, hey, I'm the prairie eagle of this area. Now, uh, in, in the description for this video, be sure to check out, uh, I'll have a link to a video I did earlier talking about why some people think that for that and many other reasons, a ferruginous hawk should be considered uh, an eagle uh, in common name, even though we know it's a bootio. Uh, and it's, it brings up some interesting points as far as how they function. But normally, ferruginous hawks like extremely open, arid, uh, landscapes, uh, desert, prairie, short grass prairie, and they're often going after ground squirrels, prairie dogs, and rabbits. They can hunt a wide range of prey, but they really specialize in that, of being able to kind of sit out there and look for, for some of these large mammalian rodent prey and lagomorphic prey. When they do it, of course, they're attacking, but a lot of times they live in areas where there's no trees, no poles. Now, they will live in areas with trees as well, but they prefer it open. And uh, if there are phone poles available, of course, they will utilize those. But one of the interesting things about them is that ferruginous hawks will hunt from the ground. They will hunt from the ground. They will spend an amazing amount of time just sitting on the ground, observing the land, uh, looking around, running around. And part of that may be just if there's not a higher perch where that's as high as you can be. But in some areas also, a lower profile can make you less uh, uh, noticeable to a colony of prairie dogs. But all the time you see rough, uh, ferruginous hawks, I keep saying rough leg by accident, ferruginous hawks on the ground. This can be a problem in training, which I'm jumping a little bit ahead to the falconry part here, but uh, because they like to hunt from the ground, perch from the ground, even the wild ferruginous hawks often have kind of shredded tails. The, the tips of their tails are kind of munched up and, and, uh, and it, that can be very frustrating also for a falconer who's been flying red-tailed hawks and you're used to, I'm walking around, there's something, go get it. And instead the bird wants to go fly up, land on the ground and hunt. And you're like, what, what are you doing? But I'll get to more to that in a minute. So just wanted to talk first about the birds themselves, their build. Uh, even though they are a classic bootio, a soaring hawk, and even though they soar just fine, for their size, their wings are surprisingly short and narrow. Uh, their wings are long, their wings are broad, but I'm saying again, using a red-tailed hawk as kind of the baseline bootio, then a uh, ferruginous hawk is about being heavier and denser and having smaller, comparatively, smaller wings, which gives a lot more power and speed. Uh, if you have a, a red-tailed hawk and a ferruginous hawk trying to fly into the same headwind, a red-tailed's like, ah, getting blown back, and a ferruginous hawk's like, mur, 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 just plows on through right into that wind, because it's denser. I've had the opportunity in a taxidermy situation to have been able to observe the musculature of a ferruginous hawk. Now you think about a bird, you've got the keel bone here, think of a Thanksgiving turkey, and you've got the muscles here, the flight muscles on either side that attach to the wing to pull it down for uh, lift and forward motion. So the bigger those muscles are, there's a correlation between the strength of the row of the flight, right? Well, compared to a red-tailed hawk, you know, or even a turkey, that just kind of ends over here on having seen an a taxonomy situation, uh, a, a, a body of a ferruginous hawk being prepped, it's like, it's amazing to see over here that the muscle goes way past and then there's a big, huge gap underneath. So they're over-muscled, under-winged, gigantic head, tiny feet with a powerful grip, uh, like to hunt from the ground. They're, they're really a very strange bird. So again, if you're looking back at those field guide books, it's like, oh, it's just a bigger, it's just like a red tail, but bigger, right? It's like, no, they're very strange. Uh, it's one of the few bootios that you might regularly try to tackle avian prey off the fist, you know, canal ducks and pond ducks and uh, things like that, you know, spook them up and have them go after it. And they can, where 
most other Budios take a moment to build up that speed. And Ferruginous Hawk just bleh, 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 instantly have that speed. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because of those things. So in falconry, you got to think about it now in terms of falconry bird, this is not a beginner bird. Okay, it's, it's not. Red-tailed hawk is a great bird for somebody learning falconry. Ferruginous hawk is on the opposite end. There's uh, several main reasons why you don't see more of them in falconry. And the one that's most often given attention to is the fact that they're hard to come by. Not, not many, to find a state where they are available in the wild and you can legally uh, procure one from the wild, there's not many states like that, okay? And so because of that, that's what's used. Well, they're kind of hard to come by. It's like, well, yeah, but there's another reason too, and this is what it is. I've mentioned in other videos how occipiters are extremely high amount of work and, and detail and attention and extremely high yield. You're going to catch so much prey with them. A properly flown ferruginous hawk is getting up there into the occipital range of the amount of attention and troubleshooting and work to have them fly properly. And most people flying a bootio are not willing to put that much effort because it's like, well, if I'm going to put that much effort, might as well put just a little bit more attention and fly a goshawk. And so that really is one of the main reasons why I see, why when I've talked with people, why they're like, yeah, you know, I flew one for a bit and then I just went back to goshawks and that's why. So usually the people who fly this species are people who have been enamored with it growing up or getting into falconry and always wanted to try one and they're trying it out or people who are just over the top passionate about the species like I am with lanner falcons you know on my videos I always talk about that how you know lanners aren't the fastest they're not the gamiest but I love them for every reason and so I love to fly them similar uh really the best ferruginous hawk falconers and ostringers that I've met over the years are people who are just enamored with the species. So they're following their passion. Uh, so it takes a lot of attention. Uh, some of the things, some of the details, first of all, perching, not too much stress about that. They are bootios, so a, a, ring, a bow perch works just fine. Uh, people have used ring perches. Uh, I've had a few friends who have used uh, block perches, like a falcon block perch, and their logic was, this is a species that likes to perch on the ground. Top of a block perch is flat, so might as well have them be like that, okay? Uh, Ferruginous hawks, as far as their legs, this is something that you have to factor in. They are booted meaning they have feathers running down their leg all the way to the base of the toes, just like a golden eagle or a great horned owl. Great horned owls have them even further down the toes. But the point is, you don't want to damage those feathers and the skin underneath is not scaly. The skin underneath is fairly soft. And so if you're going to do straight up leather anklets, I, with Ferruginous Hawks, put the smooth side inside so it can go slide along the feathers easier. But what I prefer to do, especially with a brand new Ferruginous Hawk, is to use uh, my design where I have an anklet that you have a wrap of rabbit fur that goes around front to back and then goes around. I will include a link also in the description below, which I think in the video that I'm linking, it's specifically talking about owls, that how I make these chests. I make them for owls, for Ferruginous Hawks, rough-legged Hawks, Harris Hawks to keep them warm, and occasionally the brand new Golden Eagle. But um, I'll put that link down below so you can see how to make those. But that really helps a new Ferruginous Hawk when it's getting into the groove and acclimating to wearing falconry equipment. Uh, a normal glove is just fine. Uh, they don't grip any harder than a red-tailed hawk. You don't need any specifically fancy glove. Weight management is normal, uh, but just you have to pay much more attention to it. They're a thinking bird who seems to do a lot more thought processing than, say, a red tail. That's my opinion based off my experience, but that's they seem a bit brainier and more prone to go self-hunt. Uh, now the hunting style, what are you gonna do with hunting style? Well, because I mentioned earlier, remember, they like to hunt from the ground. That can be a big problem. If your bird goes and lands on the ground and you're like, oh no, and you call it to the fist, then it is just trained you. All I have to do is fly away from this person and they'll give me food and they're not gonna hunt. So if they keep doing that, just keep walking the direction you are going uh, and then they'll ho oh, oh, and they'll probably follow you 
Uh, you can hold your glove up, but with no food. A lot of successful falconers flying fruginous hawks have done either a, a short T-perch or their glove without a reward, and they let the bird just do these short circles. So you're going out there, bird flies off the fish, circles around, comes back. Flies around, comes back. And in that way, it's just using you as a, as a perch, it's scanning, looking for food, and if it sees something, it will go pounce it. Uh, they do have a tenacious ability to chase very long distances if they're keyed in and if you have them at the proper weight and the proper um, exercise level to where they can handle it. Uh, so a big, long, direct pursuit of a, you know, of a jackrabbit, they can handle that. Uh, I don't know anybody personally who has used them to hunt tree squirrels. I think they're poorly designed for it. Uh, they're, they're really meant for open country. I'm sure they could handle it. But prairie dogs, ground squirrels, jackrabbits, cottontails, and the occasional duck or pheasant are really much more of where it's at with these birds. Now, as far as the age, uh, I have flown imprints. If you, you know, get a young bird from a nest, there is extra consideration. Most raptors can actually put up with a healthy amount of action going wrong around in or near their nest. You know, they get mad, and then they go back to their nest and they're fine. Fruginous hawks are much more they're more delicate and sensitive about disturbance around the nest. So if you are pulling a, a, an IS from a nest, key in, get your binoculars, get your spotting scope, and plan ahead, but don't keep visiting the nest. Key in on the right time and pull the IS and then leave as quickly as you can because they are much more prone to be sensitive and uh, not return if they're bothered too much. So that's something to factor in. Personally, between the two choices of an imprint, whether it's a captive bred imprint or an imprint from the wild uh, versus a passage bird, I've had much more luck flying passage birds. The imprints, I I don't, it's, it could very well just be my training as well, but the imprints I've found much more prone to want to go land on the ground, where the passage birds seem to already have perching to find food figured out better and ride the fist much better with a passage bird. Now, hooding. I would recommend don't hood them. I have had, I've only... I've only had one fruginous hawk that was a good hooder. And there, and again, there's a difference between hooding and hood training a bird, but even so, their mentality is more like an occipiter. There are some occipiters where you are ruining your relationship trying to hood train them, and they'll resent it. Fruginous hawks, for whatever reason, most of them just don't lend themselves well to it. There are exceptions to the rule, but my recommendation is to, and, and again, I am very pro hood training and respectfully, calmly working. Um, there's all different techniques for hood training, but again, my attitude with the fruginous hog is nope. I use a giant hood, which is a, a, a large travel box that they can perch in, or else I've had some that are so nice and so mellow and understand, hey, I know what we're doing, that they can just ride unhooded on a bow perch in your vehicle and and they're not bouncing off they're just like okay we're going to the hunting ground all right and so figure out what works for you but just ahead of the game i recommend that, that you do not do hooding or try it but again it's also hard where their mouth is so much wider it is hard to properly get a properly fitted with the mouth opening at the right amount because here's what i'm saying to get the beak opening perfect and not have a little bit of a gap over here with, that lets light through that they respond to and kind of look out of is very tricky because of the shape of their mouth. It can be done, but it's tricky to do. So uh, I wouldn't push the hood issue too far with them. They are amazing birds. They're, they're wonderful birds. They have a wide range of color phases too. Uh, from There's very dark chocolate colored ones, some that are uh, almost look like golden eagles even. And there's very light ones. There's some that are, when you're driving down the road in the desert and you see one, you're like, wait, that's a jeer falcon from the front. And you get a little closer and you're like, it's a, they're pure white, everything on the front and only a little bit of brown on the back. Uh, so you get a wide range of colorations. Uh, they're all gorgeous birds. But again, the things to remember as, uh, as far as your equipment, you gotta pay attention to how you handle the booted, the booted lakes. Almost any perch will do, but a bow perch or a ring perch are advisable. Uh, I recommend not hooding 
I recommend a passage over a uh, over an imprint over an IS. Uh, they're very good hunting off the fist, but you can train them to do other things from soar hawking to going from a tea perch to you can have them hunt from the ground. But they're incredible birds. Their feathers are more delicate. So you just have to put a lot of thought into them. So do not take this bird on lightly. If you are a new falconer in a state or a country where they're available and it's your first bird, don't do a ferruginous hawk as a first bird. It's very wise to have had a couple other species, especially red tail is a great one to fly first. So you understand the basics of bootio mentality. Like the really the best way, my, my opinion, Best way to fly a ferruginous hawk would be to fly a red-tailed hawk successfully, then fly a goshawk successfully, and then do a ferruginous hawk. That honestly would be the order I would do. Uh, but, you know, it, you can pursue however you do, or if you're a falconer in the United States, however your sponsor advises you. But <clears throat> fascinating birds, amazing birds to watch in the wild. I'm lucky we have a ton of them here in Utah, even though they're kind of a sensitive species. And I always love seeing them, watching them hunt, watching them dive, watching them run around on the ground. Um, <clears throat> for trapping them, uh, it's, it, you know, I've, you, you know, usually we use a ball chat tree trap with a rodent inside, but honestly, my favorite way to trap ferruginous hawks is with a pigeon harness with a drag line and, and just watching the athleticism of young, untested passage ferruginous hawks <laughs> diving after a pigeon and chasing a pigeon on a drag line. It's incredible to watch. And then seeing them trained and hunting. Uh, there's there's nothing quite like a ferruginous hawk in direct pursuit. It's just you 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 see them flying and you see the distance they're covering how quickly and it's just it's like you took two red-tailed hawks, <laughs> smushed them into one bird, put a jet pack on them and <laughs> It's just, it's a much more powerful flight. And it doesn't have as much of this like you do with the sippeters. You know, your twists and turns, except for the very end, you know, it's a little more nuanced. It's 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 a little less uh, spastic and dramatic like an occipiter, but still it's in a class far beyond what you will find with any other Budio. So even though they're our largest Budio in the United States, they are very much also the fastest and the most athletic, and I think they're incredible. So uh, I hope this is a good little introduction. Uh, sometimes my videos get a little long and I didn't wanna go too long on this. So if you have questions, let me know down below any other questions or thoughts or things you would like to know about ferruginous hawks. And uh, as always, happy hawking.